unification. We went over this briefly last time. The only part we didn't really talk about is the occurs check right here, line eight. We skipped that line. So what if I'm trying to unify a function and a function? Well, check out the argument list. A function and a variable. Well, we're just going to substitute in the function where the variable occurs unless the variable is occurring in the function. Now, why wouldn't we want to allow that? Kachink, why don't we want to allow unifying x and f of x? Well, because what would that even mean? <laughs> like if you're supposed to, supposed, to, supposed, to, supposed to substitute f of x for x everywhere, but then x occurs in f of x, then do you have like f of 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 f I mean, it's just like not obvious what to do there. So mm, don't do that. <laughs> Can't do that. Um, and you might say, okay, this is a like kind of strange occurrence. When would that ever come up? Well, your trusty professor spent the 20 minutes before class thinking of an example where I think it happens. So if you have, if this is like equals, like John is, you know, a, a equals x and x, and not equal like John and mother of John, or you know, z and mother of z. Uh, so if you try and unify these things, okay, you're, you're see the ac you'll be you'll be going along the argument list, and you're like, okay, x, z can do that. I'll replace z with x everywhere it occurs. So now you have x and f of x, and you're like, hmm, can I substitute f of x for x? <gasps> x occurs in f of x, can't do that. So even though we have standardized a part, the fact that you're doing unification can cause things like this to happen. So be careful. Um, another thing that I stuck on this slide, just because there was a lot of white space, um, is um, how nasty, First, this is, the, this is the dark side of first order logic. Um, is functions. A lot of people think the dark side of first order logic is the quantifiers, because that's why first order logic is so wonderful. People have this feeling that something so wonderful must have a dark side. But quantification, I can't think of a single bad thing to say about quantification, especially existential quantification, because we can get rid of it. But we get rid of it with functions, and functions are dangerous. Functions are what make first order logic uh, well, one of the things that makes it so awful, um, even if I have really small little predicates here that only take a single argument, we already have infinity through nesting of functions. So if, if I have a KB that looks like this and I try and unify these two clauses together, I'm going to substitute f of x for z and I will just have created P of F of F of X. And um, then I can resolve that against this again. And now I'm substituting for Z P F of F of X. And now I've just, I have a factory for generating infinite nesting of F. So even with this teeny little finite input, resolution is going to generate an infinite number of resolvents. So that's a little scary uh, if you like things like termination, which is a nice property for algorithms to have. So um, resolution refutation is complete for first order logic. It will uh, find bottom if bottom can be derived. But if bottom can't be derived, you will not necessarily ever realize it. You will keep searching for a heart of gold forever, forever, forever. Um, and you will get tired and you will want to stop, but you won't know if you might just be three resolutions away. Um, so that's called semi-decidable. Um, so if the answer is yes, the query does follow from the KB, the 
theorem proving will terminate. But if it doesn't, you'll never know. You'll, and you'll not be now, there are KBs that are so simple that, in fact, you do run out of things to resolve and you can stop. But that's not guaranteed to happen. No. No. There's like a formal proof for this that I don't know off the top of my head, but we could look it up come to my office hours. Um, come to my office. Uh, uh, Thursdays, 10.30? Make an appointment. Send me an email. Okay. Well. Okay. So, uh, so that's the downside is semi-decidability. The upside is completeness. Yay, completeness, um, which is awesome. Completeness is great. Uh, and this guy, Goodall, who was a total weirdo, he wore heavy black coat year round, always cold, always self-medicating, like huge amounts of pills. He was a hypochondriac, always thought he was sick. Um, kind of weird guy, big, fun, funny, like big, big, dark glasses, very like round, very, very weird guy. Um, he's best known for something called his Gödel's incompleteness theorem. But what gets less press, and what I want to celebrate today, is Gödel's completeness theorem, um, which says that hey, for third logic, there exists a, com a set of complete inference rules. Now he didn't know what they were. This was only 1930. They barely had zippers back then. Um, <laughs> but, but then uh, Herbrand came along. It was a French guy, so his name is probably Herbrand. Um, so Herbrand, um, he was a math guy, kind of like Gödel, and math people love to think big thoughts. So Herbrand was like, oh, wow. What if we substitute all possible constants and all possible combinations of constants and functions in place of all the variables? So now my KB, instead of having pretty little variables all lined up, just has like ground terms everywhere. Whoa, wouldn't that be cool? Well, it would be infinite for a lot of KBs because um, of the nesting of functions. Um, but he came up with this idea, and Mr. Herbrand proved in his, his PhD dissertation, note to all you grad students in the audience, we're talking, you know, 80 years later about somebody's PhD dissertation because it was that awesome. Um, if a set of clauses is unsatisfiable, then there exists a finite subset of the Herbrand base that is also unsatisfiable. If it's unsatisfiable, you can prove it just using ground clauses. Now, unfortunately, he was so happy after doing his PhD dissertation that he went on vacation in the Swiss Alps and fell off a mountain and was killed. Uh, so maybe that says, like, don't do a great dissertation. I don't know. Anyway, don't party too hard, I guess, is my, what I take away from that. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 the hard way. Uh, so, uh, so then later on, someone else, I think this was Robinson as well, uh, I, don't, I don't really remember, I seem not to have written it down, came up with this ground resolution theorem. If a set of ground clauses is unsatisfiable, then the resolution closure of those clauses contains bottom. So this says that resolution is complete on ground clauses. And then Robinson in 65 said, okay, Putting one and two and three together, um, if there's a proof on the ground clauses, then if I just like undo the, the grounding that Herbrand did and think about it in terms of the variables, then that proof is totally going to work on the, the lifted version, the original version where we had variables in place of the constants and functions. Okay. Is this kind of making sense? Does anyone ever, anyone ever understand what grounding means? You're going to have to implement grounding in assignment three. So I just want to point out what it is now. Okay. You take, like we've got P of X. 
And we've got like dolphins and fish and mammals and other things. So you substitute, you just say, well, P of dolphins, P of fish, P of Dan, P of the table, P of everything, since for all X, P of X. So you can just write down all the constants. And now we don't need that for all X, P of X anymore because we've written down everything it's true of. And you have to include functions too. So you have P of mother of table and P of mother of Dan and P of mother of fish and, you know. Every single combination. And that might be potentially fi infinite. Now, that's troublesome. I agree. Could we have P of mother of mother of mother of Dan? Exactly. You might have that. So assignment, don't worry about assignment three yet. We are going to, like, the, I, we're not going to do anything finite in, or, or infinite for assignment three. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. No, none. <laughs> yeah, nothing. None, 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 none. Just the idea. I just want. I just want to put put the seed of this idea in your heads. Um, the idea that you can take something that has variables that's like operating at this very exalted plane of existence, like first order logic. Wow, and you can think about grinding it down till it's almost as scuzzy and dirty looking as propositional logic. Like it's like p of fish. Like, how much more basic and blood-headed can you get than just constants? Uh, yeah, I mean, you, yeah. Then so, so that's grounding. And uh, this also is the proof of, the sketch of the proof of the completeness of resolution refutation on for first order logic. So that's handy to know, too. Other questions about this? Ooh, um, it's, uh, it's kind of up to you. I think I have that in here as one of the, uh, one of the uh, possible optimizations that you can do. Checking for, for uh, subsumed clauses, maybe removing tautologies. Uh, I don't know, am I going to flip out if you don't do it? Correctness before speed. Okay. Is that, that, that's, I think, the mantra to keep in mind. Correctness before speed. Yeah. 